My vision about the future of banks is that banks should be invisible. Balash, thank you very much for joining me today on this episode of Inside the Vacuum. I'm so glad to have you on because you actually have a background in the industry starting, is it the late 90s that you first sort of got involved in yeah. this? Yeah, it's very painful to talk about this, but yeah, it started in, I mean, the company itself, which I founded, it started in 96. So it's way earlier than the whole fintech boom is just started. So that's, uh, yeah, a long time. When you sort of look back at it, what the industry was like back then, because this is like, if we actually think about it, this is the era of the dial-up modem and, you know, no mobile phones, none of that. There was, there was nothing. Like, I remember back still those weird sounds that you sort of just plug it in into the telephone. The other person in the room couldn't jump on a call because, you know, you were on the internet. That was a very different time. Most people don't remember that at all. So how, how do you see the industry has changed from back in the late 90s to now the Corona times of the early 2020s. Yeah, it's interesting. You know, that's unfortunately the industry itself, it's not changed that dramatically quickly as I expected. So that, uh, to be honest, that's as you write, that, uh, you know, that's in 1978, there was the dial-up mode. So that we still did not have connected internet, especially not Wi-Fi. But on the other hand, the Western European side, that there was a really big boom. So that, you know, also the banking and the financial industry was working hardly. That's how they are able to ride on this wave and finding the, the new version of electronic channels. You know, that most of the banks in Western Europe already they had some Fed client versions, especially for corporate bankings, but very limited, you know, solutions for any retail. And we were one of the first ones who started to working on the real online banking, browser-based retail banking solutions. Not just alone, we worked together with a German company called Brokat, and they were kind of like a blue chip on the, on the Neue Markt, German version of the Nasdaq. And that's how the whole company was started to grow up. And early 2000s, you know, that the whole hype was just even bigger. And also the mobile phone is, is just getting boomed on the market. And it's so funny, but uh, we developed the first version of our mobile banking solution based on WAP technology in 2000 and 2001. <laughs> wow. So, so you're really building up. So this is a 20 year old process for you now to founding the company. Is it two years ago? For me? Yeah, exactly. You know, that's, which is, I think that the good story in the whole mobile banking process, what we started, that how the people expectation is, is just bigger than the reality. You know, that uh, we, in 2000, we were hundred percent sure that the mobile banking is the future, but it's not really happened. And it just started in 2007. So we started to invest quite early to be able to harvest the right success. What was the, what was the thing that you, what was the insight that you had back then that is only now coming into fruition? What's the, what's the big thing that people didn't believe you back then? You know, that's one, one of the, of course, it's a very, very early, you know, things what we, what we told to the people that the whole cashless society is just, just getting there. And we expected that it's gonna happen in the early 2000s, it's not happened, but right now in 2020, especially together with the COVID, you know, the people just realized that cash is not an important piece anymore. You can do anything without, without cash. And doesn't matter where you are in the world. Of course, in Asia, this boom is started a little bit earlier than, than, in, than in Europe or in, in the US, but we are there. So it, it was, it was really that shift from people just carrying cash around to now having this thing in their hand, which they can just use to pay for everything. And you also get the additional dates where they paid, how they paid, what they paid for and that sort of thing. Do you see that also shifting or are we still sort of in the very basics, early stages of it's still a transaction and there's not that much metadata? You know, it's, it's as, as all the revolution is, it's coming by leapfrogs. 
So, you know, some of the countries who were well underdeveloped from this point of view, I mean, cash point of view and the classic uh, financial system point of view, just run much more faster than anybody else. Like the, the big countries in Asia, China, Indonesia, right now that, that's, that is, you know, a significant per percentage of the, of the total population is do not use in cash at all. However, you know, in, in Europe and especially in the US, there are still some things which is comfortable to them and they did not change it or shift it uh, until today to, to really cashless. For example, you know, checks. It's a very funny thing, but it still exists. And uh, it's a majority of the uh, US society is using checks. It's, it sounds strange, but, uh, but that's it. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I lived in the US for a bit in the early 2000s. And it was very confusing to me coming in from Europe where checks were sort of on the way out there, like you go into a supermarket and like every other person is pulling out their checkbook and it's like, oh, it's $220 for my groceries. Here you go. What? What are you doing? Why are you paying with a piece of paper? Like this doesn't seem right. <laughs> yeah. And it's so funny because some of these people are thinking that the security is just an issue of online banking or online payment. Yeah. However, they're using this piece of paper and writing something on it. So that sounds funny. <laughs> yes, I mean, this, this is something that uh, I never understood. I, I guess coming in from countries that sort of in the, in the 90s were able to innovate a lot in technology, especially in Eastern Europe, where we sort of started out with nothing, you know, resembling the telco, commu uh, telco infrastructure, the banking infrastructure of the, of the at least Western Europe or the US, we sort of got the chance to sort of skip a lot of those steps, the same way Africa is skipping a lot of those steps today. So it, it, I guess it's understandable for us to be slightly confused, but the fact that this is still going on in many parts of the world where you could have significantly more secure systems, like you said, through digitalization, yeah. it's, yeah, it's yeah and, and you know, that we just talked about the, the, how it's impact the different region by, by the leapfrog. But it's also true that the whole digital transformation is making a very wide or just getting wider and wider, you know, hole between generations. Mm -hmm. And you know, that's uh, even here in Eastern Europe or Central Eastern Europe, that's the adaption of digital trends, especially the younger generation, is completely the same as in Asia or in, uh, in the US. But for older generation, this is a huge issue and that's going to mm -hmm. be a huge issue in the society as well. And we can see right now in the reality that your generation is, does not have any issue to shopping or getting the grocery online. However, the most dangerous generation under the COVID that uh, they still do not believe that how they would be able to do it without stepping out the door. That's actually a very good point. So, I mean, even without COVID, this is something that banks still have to consider. Like they have to still have to consider that there's a, a large part of the population, depending on each country, of course, which does not want to, or has the ability or desire to do so, right? Whether that's access to the internet, access to, to, to mobile phones, that sort of thing. So how, 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 in your experience, have banks approached that? Is it just purely through physical branches or are there some strategies that they've employed to sort of bridge the gap somehow? You know, that I think these, these shifts already happened in the, uh, very similarly happened in 2008, I mean, the financial crisis. When the banks decided that they need to save some cost, how they are able to save cost, of course, automatization, digitalization, get less branch, less people, more online, more digital. And you know, that's, uh, it's shifted up the trend and right now they are in a better phase. However, you know, still the solutions is quite oldish. So right now there is another shift because people are simply not able to going into the branch. It's not really secure. So they don't want to use it cash anymore. So that's right now, this is another shift for them or another possibility for them. But this is just accelerating the trends which is already happened. So probably this is even better for those banks or those financial institutions who are more prepared on the digital transformation journey point of view. They are 
I be able to sell something online, handling the customer relationship online. They already have online and mobile solutions, which is the UX is good enough to be able to serve all the wide range of generations. Yeah, and we're seeing, we're seeing that all over the world where now governments are stepping in, trying to get money to people. And there are countries who have, let's call them fintechs or banks who are more advanced at this and those that aren't, and they're having issues. Like I hear the United States has a lot of issues actually getting the money to people because the infrastructure isn't there, but the UK is much better at it because they, you know, they've invested a bit into the ecosystem and a lot of digital transformation has happened there. You're the president and investor of Whoop. So yeah, we call it Whoop, but yeah. So how did that name come about? Uh, I don't know. <laughs> it sounds like Seven Up, but uh, something similar. <laughs> but probably it was WhatsApp, but uh, they just already copied it. Yeah. <laughs> so you guys are are doing something sort of cool. You're trying to sort of bring AI into the equation here for banking digital transformation products, right? So can you tell me a little bit more about that? Yeah, that's uh, so very simply that's. The WAP sales up product is a personalization platform. So it means that, that you know, so from the bank's point of view, that is a very old slogan that's know your customer. And what we say, know your customer in context, which is even more important. Because if you just try to advertise them something, but this is not relevant, not in the right time, they just refuse it. So you know that the banks also need to understand that what is the dynamics of the of the whole online sales and online advertisement business, and they do not understand it. So they still try to sell very basic product, credit card, mortgage, car loans. But these type of products is not something that the people are dreaming for. So you never dream, I want to get a good mortgage. This is not a classic dream. But this is not your favorite dream, dream to have? <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> probably a nightmare, yeah? <laughs> <laughs> yes. But, but on the other hand, people are dreaming for a new house, a new car, or buying in a Christmas shopping or a Christmas gift for someone. Yeah. And this is implicated by financial products, credit cards, mortgage, car loans. So how you are able to find the patterns of the people behavior and understand what is their financial needs. So what we do at WAP and with our sales of product, we just collecting the data, understand the people's behavior profile and try to suggest it something which is really relevant from your financial life's point of view. So do you need a specific sort of core banking system to do that or could you just sort of plug into multiple? Yeah, plug into multiple. So that's we just using the existing data what the banks already have about the client of course they know a lot of things about the client we enhanced this data and of course we are able to use it that what does it mean from the behavior point of view so it's really it's really giving that person or the bank insight into what the person is thinking rather than what they want to buy yeah exactly so that's you know that's and this is what all the really good e-commerce platform are doing today they want to understand what are you thinking and not what are you want to buy at this moment. I guess this is sort of a, a shift into, into where banks aren't purely a uh, utility for people. They're really facilitator of their life. They're making things easier for them to accomplish, to survive through an issue maybe here like COVID we have today, although this is hard to predict, I guess. So it's, it's really a sort of a next step for banking to, to introduce this. You know, that's what we realized, of course, at the beginning, we started to develop online and mobile banking. But what we realized, what does it mean online banking? To be honest, the process is just went through that used to be the banks did everything on paper. Later on, they realized that they need to some computerized background, so they develop the co-banking. Later on, they give access for some people, which they call it, you know, back office workers to these systems. Mm -hmm. Later on, they give the same access to the branch people. And later on, they copy the branch and they put it online. Mm -hmm. And all the things what used to be was made by the branch officers, today it's made by you. But the logic, and the system background, all in all, is the same. 
So this is transactional systems. You can do transfer, you can do a deposit, and so on and so forth. But this is still a very transactional system. However, banks is about your financial behavior and your financial needs. So you need to be able to have the people, how they are able to go in through in this financial situation. Doesn't matter if this is, for example, a rainy day because of the COVID, they lost their job, and right now they need to live in on their savings, or probably the savings is not enough, so they need to get the credit, but they need to have some predictions. It used to be, this was the meaning of banking. You know, it's not just talking about the private banking, but the branch people also understood their clients and they knew a lot of things about their clients. Who is their family, how they are belonging to the society and so on and so forth. And right now, this knowledge is just about one and zeros and we need to be able to have it on the same level of understanding on the digital world. And this is what we try to recreate on the digital banking level, how the banks are able to understand their clients' needs and how they are able to get more engagement and later on possibly more sales to generate. Is this now running in banks currently? This is already running in several banks in Europe. So for example, one of our biggest clients is uh, Raiffeisen Group. So they have the same solution in four countries at the moment. We are working with the BMP Paribas in two countries. Uh, the third one is just started, so CH General in one country, and we are just getting forward and forward. So there is a plan of customers who we already apply. Wonderful. So can you, tell, can you share some sort of fun applications of how they've used this to create new experiences for their customers? Oh, yeah, yeah. So that's, you know, this is mainly about the mobile channels. Of course, this is a channel independent solution, so you can use this data each of every interaction channel, but the most typical is the, is the mobile itself. Mm -hmm. So that's one of the best examples, which is easy to understand, and that if you just arrive into the airport and the banks already seen that you already bought an, a, a flight ticket to somewhere, they are offering for you in a special FX rate because they see that you will spend something in, in British pounds or in US dollar, and probably you do not have an access to the the best rate at the moment, but if they offer for you something which is relevant at the moment, it's really helpful. The travel insurance, this is also a very, very basic example. That's how you are able to use your travel insurance when they realize that you are abroad, either because you bought a ticket or because of your geolocation, they are immediately offer you a travel, uh, travel insurance or just activate your travel insurance. But it's also true that if they see that how many times are you traveling by car, they are able to make a very simple calculation that what would cost for a, for a car loan for you in a month. And probably this is comparable with the cost of, the, your, of your taxi cost and so on and so forth. So that's all of these type of small, really small insights the really complex one, like for example, the mortgage. The mortgage is the most complex, of course, to understand that when the people are ready to buy a new house, it's not really easy to, to expect, but even not for, for ourselves who really wants to buy a new one. But if you buy a lot of things in the IKEA, that it also means that you want to make a renovation. And if the bank sees that probably your cost is, is higher in monthly than your income, that they are immediately able to, uh, a rebuilding credit or uh, just a simple overload. Yeah, so the, the, the complexity here is sort of unimaginable as to how the bank can potentially help you in many different parts of the life. So if you sort of would have to put on your little, your futurist hat, where do you see this going maybe 10, 20 years from now? How will the bank change because of technology like this? You know, that's my vision about the future of banks is that banks should be invisible. So that's, uh, you know, that's from, from our personal point of view, who are just clients of banks. Banks and the brands is just meaning always frustration. Because, you know, that's if I need to take care about my, my banks, it means that there are some frustration what I need to solve. So mm -hmm. if they would be able to make it, being part of the ecosystem on a way that they can be invisible, that's, the perfect location for themselves. 
And this is the small, tiny things that how they are able to help you in this whole life of journey. That's okay, or life journey. That's okay, right now I'm a student and I wanna get an, uh, a student loan, but I don't need to go into the branch to be able to get a support, but I just click in on the, the next application on the university and immediately get in an offer from the bank that this is just the button what you need to click it on and you get the, 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 the tuition credit or something like that. Or later on, that's when you, you know, want to buy your new house, you already seen it that the area that, that this is the place where I want to buy a house and there is an immediate calculation that what is the potential credit what you are able to, potential level of mortgage what you are able to get, what is your salary, what is your uh, uh, monthly installment capability. So this is an immediately pre-built application that you just need to click it on the buy the house and everything is going to be smooth. Not just running papers all over the world and all over the city to be able to organize in a month's time this process. Oh, so, this so is... my vision is the, the best banking is invisible. So this is really just a, a phase of banking where it becomes your partner in life, really, and just guides you through the, your various stages, wherever money is involved in some way or fashion, whether that's insurance or actually getting a loan or saving up money. It's, it's, it's like a partner helping you along, be, being almost like that old school banker who you sort of walked in and he sort of told you about your bank account and you know the, the really old school community banks that you sort of see in the movies uh, maybe in the 50s or maybe in some imaginary fantasy world it's a nice vision the really big marble you know stones on the on the branch <laughs> <laughs> exactly so i would like to thank you very much for for joining me today to talk about you know the future of banking i really love the idea of invisible banking and and really make converting that bank into something less about the hassle of the papers and everything, but more about the day-to-day -day life and, and being part of you, your, your, your everyday situations. So before we go, I'd like to sort of ask you if there's lots of FinTech founders uh, that are now exploring how they could fit into the, into the space, how they could help out, how, how they could make their own mark, what would you suggest they focus on or what would you suggest them to do now that they're thinking about finance as a, as a potential place to disrupt? They do not need the really big idea, which is completely unique. It doesn't exist in the world and probably it's big enough to making the, the new version of Facebook or something like that. I think small ideas is also able to help on the world. And the, the, the banking ecosystem is typically a word where I are very small, tiny things. What you are able to revolutionize, it's big enough to be able to make a great company and probably a billion valuation. So do not thinking in too big and do not wait to the really big idea. Just find the small space for yourself and try to do it in the really right way. Work, work a lot and a long time and probably it's gonna be successful. Thank you so much. If people want to find you, uh, whether that's yourself or WAP, how can they reach you and the company? Well, WAP.digital, WAP this is the web address where you are able to get more information. For myself, I'm on LinkedIn, quite active, so that uh, you can just write me or call me. That's, uh, it's quite easy to reach me. Thank you so much and have a wonderful, wonderful rest of April. Thank you very much. Thank you. Stay safe. Thank you, bye.